isn't that what we all want? To be happy? Hello. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstutter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can email me at max at hippodirect.com for any help building and growing your podcast. This is episode number 60, and today's guest is the one and only Nicole Holland. She's a top media coach and strategist, and she's been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, Huffington Post, and more. She hosts the Nicole Holland Show and also her new show, Fascinating Founders. Her specialty is podcast guesting, that is getting you on podcast to grow your brand and your business. And in this episode, she covers that and much, much more. You'll hear stories from her time as a correctional officer, plus why every decision she makes goes back to happiness and joy and, of course, some incredible tips on creativity. It's time to hear from the rock star herself. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with the queen of podcast guesting. And would you have it? She is from the Nicole Holland Show. Nicole Holland, how are you doing today? I am so great, Max. It's great to be here. It is. It is. Uh, you know, we've been connected for a while. This has been a long time coming and so cool. I think you've done such an amazing mix of things in your career and you really, really specialize on the PR side and in podcast guesting. So we will dive deep into that later. But before we get rolling, you mind giving everybody a brief synopsis of before you got into what you would call your current professional career, what did your life look like? Oh my gosh. Well, before I started working online, I was a correctional officer. So I was working with murderers and rapists and maintaining um, their health, safety, and welfare. And oh, my well, I mean, who is it? Looked totally different. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. That's a hell of an elevator pitch. Uh, <laughs> no. Yes. The correctional officer part is insane. You, you might not be uh, surprised to know that you're the first correction, former correctional officer on our show. Can you describe those times for a little bit? I mean, how did you get into that role in the first place? Oh my gosh. It was such a twisty, turny, interesting adventure over my lifetime, right? I was really focused on working with families and children in crisis for many, many, many years. And through that work, I wound up working with adjudicated male youth at an alternative facility to jail. It was an amazing program. Um, the parent company is called Right of Passage. There's a number of locations throughout the U.S. And they have different academies and facilities for different purposes. And the one that I worked at, uh, we dealt with adjudicated male youth. So they already were sentenced and they, for some reason, had somebody advocating for them. They had somebody fighting to say, this kid is not the kid that needs to sit behind bars. This is the kind of kid we can rehabilitate. We can change their life and we can help them become a successful member of society, um, somebody who gives, somebody who understands, who, who values others, who has empathy. And um, yeah, that's what we did. So it was a very difficult program to get into uh, for the youth, but it was, it was very high. Um, a lot of they had to go through interviews. They had to jump through a lot of hoops and stuff. And then they had to actually adhere. So it was a, it was a positive peer culture model. And um, the young men were treated as young men. And they had to do treatment groups. And they had to get an education. And they had to play a sport to learn how to interact on a team. They had to do more than what their court-ordered community service was. You know, they would do a lot of Special Olympics stuff where – they would be um, supporting the athletes and all kinds of stuff. So we had all these different positive 
opportunity. Oh, and they all had to do a, voc a vocation as well. So they had all these different things they had to do, very, very structured. And the the success rate of the company was phenomenal. And so I wound up getting into that. I worked there. I had just fallen in love with that model of being able to make a difference, make an impact in the world through working with really tough kids and kind of that second chance opportunity. Um, and so from there, I did all kinds of things from from fostering, from outreach, um, where I worked with the police and the ministry. It's um, uh, in the States, you guys call it child services or CPS, I think, um, mm -hmm. to where I would do crisis support and interventions when things happened on the street, all kinds of wild stuff. And that little by little through a series of interesting life events got me to coming out to Ontario to work in a new youth facility. And then I was, was not impressed. I was not impressed at all. Um, I felt that the facility I was at actually did more harm than good. And I wound up taking a, an opportunity to transfer into the adult system, which is how I became a correctional officer. And, um, and it just didn't suit me. It didn't serve me. It drained me. I was unhappy. I was very sick. Uh, physically and spiritually and emotionally. Um, and after a while of doing that, I just promised myself I wouldn't do it anymore. And I upheld that promise to myself uh, and started an online business. <laughs> and and it's evolved to this. <laughs> that is the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, my last uh, official date as a correctional officer was the 28th of December, 2014. Wow. So at the time of this recording, I mean, it has been an incredibly different past five years for you than uh, the five years before that. But what, so, I mean, that's an incredible life you lived and the opportunity you had to speak with and, and help those young men that um, obviously had gone through some very, very dark times. What is the biggest thing you took away from that experience and, and learned from those young men? Gosh, there's so much, right? Um, one thing that I took away from the experience is that I believe, like, because I've seen it and I know, despite what many other people think, that rehabilitation is 100% possible. And it's not easy. And it takes a special kind of focus and programming. But I have contact to this day through Facebook with some of the kids that I worked with all those years ago, who have families, who have careers, who are doing great things in the world. One of the guys has has a, a company, um, a sandwich franchise, or it's, I think he started it and he has multiple now. I think it's, it's a franchise. And then, wow. you know, I also get letters in the mail from one of my favorite kids I worked with who, you know, when he was 15 was already pretty like, you know, it, it didn't have a good outlook. Like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, he didn't have the road ahead paved in gold. And um, fortunately, he kept himself out of jail for a really long time. But now he's, he's doing uh, a long-term stint in, in a federal correctional facility. And so just even that I get the letters, you know, every once in a blue moon, it's so, like, it, it's so... I don't know if rewarding's the right word. There's really no words, but he he will write things like, you know, I wish I had listened to you, things like that. And I always used to write back. I haven't heard from him in quite some time, but I always used to write back and say, you know, it's never too late. And today's the first day of the rest of your life. And so just getting those letters reminds me that there he still has hope. He doesn't have necessarily belief but that I, that I was able to get through and make some kind of difference in the back of his mind. That's unbelievable. I mean, it really puts things in perspective. And uh, 
I know this is going to be a hell of a segue to some business stuff, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but there is one. What do you think you took from those years and to helping others and coaching others in that regard that helped you, you know, once you pivoted to going out on your own in the business world and really for your career and in recent years, you've been all about coaching and, and helping others from a, a business standpoint. Yeah. So I should also mention that, you know, actually 20 years ago, I had a corporate training firm and I I wasn't always a correctional officer. So uh, my first love was marketing, um, guerrilla marketing. I worked <laughs> in um, professional sports and entertainment with uh, the Washington Bullets and Capitals organization way back when they were called the Bullets. I was going to um, say, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, they're the wizards that. now. Yeah. So, I mean, marketing has always or was always something that I loved doing and helping people has always been something I've loved doing. It's just naturally in me, you know, there's pictures of me as a very young, like a toddler helping people. So I've always <laughs> wanted to help people. And I think that throughout my life in the different iterations of it, that's been a core um, driver, right? So whether, and I think that was a big part of my losing myself and being so unhappy working as a correctional officer because I was no longer helping people. I was just, I felt like I was just a cog in the wheel of harming people, to be honest with you. The things that I was seeing going on inside of the last facility I worked at, you know, literally made me sick. And there was nothing I could do to change that. And when I tried changing that, when I tried bettering a situation, I would get, it would not be well received and I would cause more problems and pain for myself. So that was really off my path, but I've always, always, always wanted to help people and I've sought out ways to help them achieve their goals and make their dreams a reality forever. And it was just innately who I was. I mean, as far back as you know, being a, a a child in school and saying, oh, you know, I see this population. Oh my gosh, actually, I just remembered, you know, I was probably seven or eight and we would go to Washington, D.C. My aunt lived in Washington, D.C. and not in a great part of town. And I would see these people, you know, sleeping on park benches. I would see them um, going through garbage for food and it hurt my heart. And so, my aunt taught me because I, I was so upset. I, I brought down some stuff for them and I tried to give it to them, you know, like blankets because it was getting cold and um, collected coats from my house and the neighboring people and took it down. And my aunt said, they're not taking it from you because they're proud. They're not choosing to be here. So you can't just give them. They're not begging. They're not people who are asking for a handout and it's embarrassing for them. So you have to actually go put the things in the garbage and then they will take them out of it because then it's there. They're working for it. They're not taking a handout. And again, I was probably seven or eight at the time and we wound up, you know, she, she watched me go over to the garbage and I put the stuff in the bin and then we walked away, but we stayed close enough for me to get the lesson she was trying to teach me. And sure enough, they went over and they started sharing the stuff and divvying it up. And um, that was a super profound moment in my life because it showed me that sometimes when we, if we truly want to help, we have to meet the other party where they're at. And this is something that I learned again when I was in school for coaching. And, and it's something that I'm reminded again and again and again, we can't truly help people unless we meet them where they're at. Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Let's get to how you help people these days, which a little bit different from some of the stories, uh, <laughs> previous stories. Um, but I know that if you take the view, if you step back and take the overall view, everything goes back to your passion for helping people. And a lot of it ties back now to in the business sense. So how to help people grow their business and to help them from a, 
a PR and marketing standpoint. So one of the vehicles or, or mediums, channels, whatever you want to call it, that is a huge focus for you now, and obviously a huge focus for me as well, is podcast and getting people on podcasts, helping people become guests on podcasts to help them from a business and marketing and PR standpoint. So why did you choose podcasts in the first place? What appealed to you? Well, podcasts chose me. It was absolutely organic how it happened. Um, I had started a podcast back in March 2016. I had no interest in podcasts. I had interviewed our friend John Lee Dumas on my summit. Um, I had a business uh, for three years. I ran something called the Business Building Rockstar Summit, where I helped entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs with marketing tactics by interviewing some of the brightest. Uh, folks in the world on specific marketing tactics. And so I, he said, you know, Nicole, you're a really good interviewer and it's a lot easier to do a podcast than it is to do a summit. You should do a podcast. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I just got too much on my plate. And then after the summit, I wound up going, okay, wait a minute. This guy knows a thing or two that I don't. So let me go look into this. And um, so we chatted and sure enough, I set the date with him, March 21st, 2016. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I did it. But what happened was I did it and I didn't have any intention with it. I didn't at the time understand that I needed to tie it into my business to get results. I saw it as a completely separate entity from my business, something to get um, brand recognition or, you know, to get people to know my name and then they would be interested in learning about my business. That was the mindset and the belief that I had at the time. And it was completely detrimental because it made things an uphill battle, right? I didn't understand that, wait a minute, I can leverage the podcast space to actually build a lead generating machine to bring my ideal clients in. So it took me some time to figure that out, which is one of the, the foundational things that I do with my clients now. I don't work with people just to build a podcast or just to get them on podcasts. I work with business owners primarily, well, in my done for you work, it's mid-market business owners, although I do have done with you work that... I work with thought leaders and uh, personal brands and such that aren't quite there. But that's a foundational piece is whether you want to be seen in, you know, on podcasts, whether you want to be seen in the media, whether you want to have your own podcast, whatever the case may be, if you're a business owner, there has to be a tie-in to your business for the tactic to actually um, move you forward to your ultimate vision and goal. That's my, that's my stance. And so <laughs> I, agree, I agree with your stance. I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was I was doing these interviews and I never wanted for guests. I never understood when people would say, Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know how to find guests or I'm like, really? Because now I'd already done the summit, the first summit. So I already had 30 like massively successful experts who knew nothing about me say yes to me to be on my summit. I already had built out systems. I already had, um, I already knew how to make things really easy and fun for them and inspiring. I didn't expect anything from these people. And yet they wanted to share our work together because they were proud of it because of what I did in the back end. And so for me, getting guests was never a question. I had more people that wanted to be on the show than I could actually put on the show. And that's why actually my show went from like one day a week originally to three days a week, or maybe I started at three days a week. I don't know. But I had more interviews I could than I could handle. And so a lot of my guests who are these brilliant, amazing people, they would say things like, wow, that was really fun. I really enjoyed that. And at the same time, I was building relationships with other podcasters because I was getting out there. I figure if I'm going to do this and I'm going to be a host, I need to understand what it's like to be in the other seat as a guest. And so I was getting to know and develop relationships with podcasters that I really liked. And so it was just very natural for me, again, to help people. I knew people that needed great guests. 
I need, I knew guests that enjoyed it. I would say things like, would you like to be on some more podcasts? Like, let me introduce you to a few of my friends. And I would make those connections to a point where that took over what I was doing with my time. And I was actually not making money because I was, I was looking for coaching clients, not recognizing what was right in front of my face. So I had to take a pause from connecting so many people. And then I had um, a guest on my show who I sought out because I used their product. I thought it was a great product. I invited them on the show, had a great time. And I said, would you, the same thing, you know, would you like to be on some more podcasts? He had not had experiences doing that before. And so he said, oh yeah, this was great. This was fun. Um, can you set that up for me? And I said, well, no, I can't set that up for you. Like, I mean, I can, I can introduce you to people. And he goes, no, I don't have time to talk back and forth with these people. Like I'm busy. I'm running my company. If you want to set up the interviews, I'll pay you to do it. But otherwise I'm not doing this. I was like, well, that's interesting. I go, hang on a second. I'm sitting here for free doing what this guy is asking me to do. I would just have to add another step to it. Huh. I said, let me get back to you on that. So I spent the night kind of going through what was the the market, the industry rate for that and all this stuff. And I came back to him the next day and I pre presented a proposal and he said, absolutely. And so that's kind of how it began. Um, once he said yes, then I sent an email just to my friends and my, you know, my, it wasn't like my email list. It was like my personal list of like guests and, and business friends that I had. And I said, hey, this might come as a surprise. I'm not sure, but here's what I am going to be doing for one person. And it doesn't make sense for me to do it for just one do you have any clients or anyone you know who might like this kind of service too? And I got bombarded with emails. And that was the beginning of how I started focusing on podcast guesting. Now, I will say, actually, it wasn't the beginning because I started focusing within a few months, a couple months of actually doing the podcast myself to talking about and teaching people about how to be a great guest. And then mm -hmm. I um, started a program called Interviews That Convert. And so I was doing that in the one-to-many um, space for quite some time until he said, you know, will you do it for me? And that's how the Done For You service started. Wow. So you clearly have a good idea what it's like from the host side and the guest side. You recognize that, hey, I can turn this into a business. And it was just such a natural, organic way that you started doing this. And obviously, your network that you had built up before was huge there. So I, I want to get into some tips for being a podcast guest. So what's your favorite way whether it's you or when you're recommending one of your clients, what's your favorite way to reach out to podcast hosts or podcasts in order to be a potential guest? Great question. So first of all, in my done for you service, we actually take care of that. So my clients never have to reach out. Um, but if what I teach for my students and what I did when I first started was just focusing on building a real relationship with somebody um, too often. <laughs> and, and you probably get these kinds of messages too, Max. Too often people shoot out a message like about what they want and why. I don't know you. I don't care what you want. Like, why should I care? I have a million people in my life that I do care about. Why? <laughs> why do I need to care about some? And I find it offensive. I find it like I have a sign on my door that says, do not knock unless you have an appointment. Because if I'm not inviting you in, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't want to hear about, you know, your new phone service or whatever. You're coming to my home where I have my life I'm living and you don't know what I'm doing at this time, but yet you feel it's appropriate to come bang on my door. This is my personal opinion, uh, but that's how I live my life. I go, wait, I would never do that. I would never do that to somebody. And so I basically just, you know, it's like, think about how you want to be treated. Do you want people just 
spamming you? Do you do you like that? Or do you want people just like coming to your door whenever they feel like it and it works for them? Of course not. So I say always treat people how you want to be treated. And to me, um, you know, I'm Canadian and I, I, we don't wear shoes in the house here. We don't wear outdoor shoes in the house. Sometimes we have <laughs> house shoes. So it's like if somebody comes in, they can see the shoes that are all off. They can see I'm not wearing them. Most people will just t- pay attention to that. Like what's the norm and subconsciously even recognize, oh, I should take my shoes off and just do it. Sometimes people will walk in on the carpet and then I'll say, excuse me, would you mind taking your shoes off? And then of course, some people like I, I let it go. It depends on, on the situation um, and who they are in relation to the visit. And so this is the same thing that I did do and teach about this virtual relationship with somebody you want to be on their show. They don't know who you are. You have no rapport. You've not been invited in. So how do you get that invite? Well, there's lots of ways. One great thing is we have social media. One thing is we have podcasts. You know you want to be on the show why do you want to be on the show? And if your answer, you want to be on the show because it's a big show, that's wrong. You have to know why you want to be on a particular show. And if it's only about you, if it's only about what's in it for you, you are most likely going to get no response or declined unless it's a brand new podcaster whose show would not benefit you probably anyhow. Um, So figure out what the host values, what they look for, what their interests are. And frankly, the easiest way to do that is to reach out and ask, not presume or not pitch yourself and then ask, but rather to compliment them. So if you know you want to be on a show because you love that show, NPS, you should. You should be able to at least like and feel that a show is worth a five-star rating and review if you're going to want a guest on it. (laughs) Listen to it. Write that five-star rating and review. You know, like know what they talk about. Know what their listeners want. Pay attention. Then give them compliments. So write the review, you know, share publicly, share an episode that you found valuable and why you found it valuable rather than just like a, you know, a quick retweet or something like that. You know, if you, if you want somebody's attention, let them know you exist. So somebody is going to get my attention more by sharing a specific interview or episode that I've done and making the comment to their audience, right? So they're sharing it on their platform, not to me in a private message or in a direct tweet. They're sharing, I love the Nicole Holland show so much. Great interview with, and then whoever the person is, right? Or this is such a good episode. I learned that X, Y, Z, give it a listen, something like that. It's unsolicited. You're reading my reviews now, aren't you? (laughs) Well, I, have you read mine? (laughs) (laughs) They're all, they're all from me. No, no. I mean, I just reviewed, I reviewed your show because I didn't, I wasn't going to come on here. Granted you reached out to me, which I was honored for and I appreciate, but I'm not going to go on a show that I haven't actually listened to. And I can't say, I love the show. I love your show. I think you're a phenomenal interviewer. I think that you know how to drill down to get the questions answered that your audience is listening for. And I'm happy to share about that. So if somebody wants to be on a podcast, they need to be able to do something like that in some way, shape or form. Also, you focus on creativity and that's huge. Like send, I mean, if you know that the person's birthday is coming up or something from your reconnaissance that you've done, send (laughs) them a, you know, a fruit bouquet or whatever, like something in the mail. It's not hard to get people's business address, send them something or even just, you know, 
I, I don't know if I would send like some kind of digital thing because they don't know you, so they may not open it. But if you put something in the post and then a quick little note to say, big fan, love the show, happy, hope you're having an amazing birthday. And, and there's something with that that you know they'll enjoy because you've paid attention. Like that's huge. Now you're on their radar. And I know that not everybody has a budget to do these kinds of things, but you've either got time or you've got money. And so if you want to make your dreams and goals come true by leveraging other people's platforms, then you need to figure out what you're going to do for it. Sorry, I'm getting like very high horsey here, but like, I just believe that. I think that we are in a generation of far too many people that feel entitled and like they deserve attention or they deserve recognition or whatever just because they're breathing. And I just don't feel that that's the case. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I like the first part better where you kept complimenting me. So you can continue doing that <laughs> about 10 minutes if you'd like. No, but seriously, you know, thank you so much. I'm very flattered. We might have to stop because I'm just blushing, but I just love your approach. I mean, it's like, take someone, for example, who just does a cold email to a potential, you know, podcast host and they want to be a guest, a, a cold email with no other forms of communication or no prior relationship versus someone who actually takes the time to get to know them and to listen to their show and, and find out, you know, more about them and why it's such a good fit and how it could be mutually beneficial. And so you just, you clearly specialize at that and very honored to receive a review from you. Just about cold emails. And again, everybody's different. Everybody's going to teach different things. But I'm relationship focused. I'm long term focused. And I believe that the, you know, the one night stand isn't going to amount to anything. So you've got to woo the person. If 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 you're going to put time into doing a podcast interview, wouldn't it be better to do one interview with somebody who already thinks you're the bee's knees rather than five interviews with people who couldn't care less about you? You're just filling a spot. I mean, to me, Absolutely. that's a no pajamas as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't actually take cold pitches. If I see cold pitches, they go into a file or they get deleted or whatever. Like now I actually keep them because I like using them for training and showing um, students and, and clients, like, here's what, you know, here's, here's what people are doing. So people take note, if you're reaching out to Nicole, you might become training material. Well, I'll tell you right now how to reach out to me, right? Get my attention. That's how you build a relationship. So the Nicole Holland show is my podcast and I'm actually starting a second podcast because when I started the podcast, it was actually called the business building rockstar show. And again, it wasn't dialed in to facilitating leads for my business. So I tried to reconfigure that. Um, at the end of last year and and relaunched the business building rockstar show as the Nicole Holland show. Unfortunately, I made some choices um, technologically that I was unaware were going to destroy my <laughs> my show in many ways. I definitely wouldn't say destroy your show, but Oh, no, no, they did. Um, so I actually <laughs> stopped recording in April and I dripped stuff out. Um, and so we've been on hiatus for some time about to just re, um, come back. And so what I have decided is for the Nicole Holland show, nobody's getting on that show unless we're friends. The only people who I'm going to have on that show from here on out are people I already have relationships with and it's, they don't have an agenda to be on my show. So you will never get, a a cold pitch will never get you on my podcast. It has rarely gotten anybody ever on my podcast, but it will never get you on the Nicole Holland show now. However, I'm starting a new show um, called Fascinating Founders, which I am looking for potential guests for. So a cold pitch gets a response to apply. Now, I got one the other day from a gal on LinkedIn that wanted to be on my show, and it was so brilliant. It was the best cold pitch I've ever seen. She did some things wrong um, that she really is spam, spamming me, but I I was so impressed with what her creativity. So I wrote her back and I said, 
first of all, please take me off of your mailing list because I have not given consent to be on it. And this is this is a violation of the can spam act. So please don't ever do that. Don't just add people to mailing lists and then send them like your cold pitch. It's disgusting. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I said, however, this is the best cold pitch I've ever received. So <laughs> with that, here's the link to go apply to be on my podcast. Do you think she has filled it out? No, she has not. She did write back and say, great, thank you. So um, she did not fill it out. Um, not yet. I mean, it's been five days. But right. we'll, keep, we'll keep checking in every two hours. <laughs> I had done this for a long time. I had a guest a guest application. And it's amazing how many people, they say they want to be on your show, but they don't actually fill out the application. They want you just to say yes, because again, they're breathing. Um, then the people who do fill it out, it amazes me how many people don't actually answer the questions that are posed. They just give you a sales pitch in what, how they want. Um, hi, that's an absolute no. If you are sending, if you're filling out somebody else's application to do something, to have them do something for you, right, and you don't even respect the process they have, why are you, it's like you're, you're actually, people remember really bad experiences and really great experiences, right? The middle ground, the, the mediocre, it's like they fall through the way, they fall by the wayside, but you could be your name can be remembered by that person like forever. Probably won't, but it could be. So think about that. If you're going to apply for something, actually put in the effort to apply. Give it your best effort. And then, um, you know, of the ones that did apply, most people who've applied have never been a right fit. So it's like, well, no. And then the handful that have been possible fits I send them a, hey, congratulations. I'd love to have you on the show. Here's what you need to know about how this runs. And then there's very detailed information. And then it says at the end, if that sounds good to you and you're in, go ahead, click this link and make your booking. And even there, a lot of people don't make the booking, which is perfectly fine. And then the ones that have made the bookings that have started with cold pitches and they've gone through this whole process, they, <laughs> they show up like they're good at answering questions or having an assistant or somebody answer questions, but they show up and they've clearly never heard the show. They clearly couldn't care less about anything I've written at all. And many times I've had to go, huh? nope, we need to end this. Um, before I, I started doing that, I would just go through it and then go, why am I going to publish this? And I wouldn't publish it. Although in the beginning I did. So in any case, that's a lot of information, but I hope that's helpful for anybody who's thinking about cold pitching or maybe who has been cold pitching. Focus on the benefit to the other person. And that's not the benefit that you believe you bring to the other person. That's the benefit that they are looking for that they believe is important figure that out figure out what they want give it to them without any quid pro quo or any expectation in return and you're going to start developing relationships with the hosts and the influencers and generally the people the human beings that you want to have in your life and i think it's so key to think about the benefit because you really have to put yourself in the other person's shoes or in the other person's house shoes if we're in Canada and think about what is important that what would appeal to them about your pitch. And in terms of finding these people, finding, obviously it's important if you're reaching out to be a guest on someone's show, it's important you know about this show. But what about somebody who it has a book coming out in a certain subject area, a subject field, or is a specialist in a certain subject area and wants to start getting way more active about being a guest on podcast shows, where should they go to find shows that would be a good fit for them? Well, you've got to know, first of all, where are you at? So anybody can write a book, okay? The truth is that in today's world, anybody can write a book and have it published and it can be a bestseller, even though it's not formatted properly and the 
the spacing is, uh, you know, the, there's errors. It, it doesn't matter. So having a book now doesn't mean, it doesn't give you a whole lot of clout in um, the podcast guesting space. Um, if you're published, you know, by a publishing house that has a significant um, name, then that's a whole nother thing. So know where you're starting at. Do you have an audience of hundreds of thousands or millions of people? Do you have an audience of your mom and brother? Like, where are you at in terms of your own authority, right? If you're looking to get on podcasts and you have zero authority and you just, you know, you wrote a book or whatever you've done and you want the world to to notice you and, and know who you are, unfortunately, I think this is the propaganda people have been fed for for the last couple of years. Anybody can be a celebrity, you know, you just got to blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But it's not true. It's not true. Like you have to actually have value to share. So that's number one. Um, assuming that you are legit and you have a launch or you have um, uh, a niche book or whatever the case may be, you already have a considerable following, like find shows that have your buyers. That's that's a big thing. Like most people just they want to be everywhere because Gary Vee can be everywhere. So they think, oh, okay, <laughs> I should be everywhere too. Um, a press release can be helpful if it's appropriate for where you're at in your business. A publicist is going to a good publicist is going to be worth their weight in diamonds. There is not a lot of good publicists out there. There's a lot of people who essentially are administrative assistants or VAs who figure out, oh, this is a hot topic. I can go sell and say, I can get you on shows, but they don't necessarily understand how to get you on the shows that are going to move the needle forward for you in your business. So if you can, if you have the budget, again, it's time or budget, right? If you have the budget to hire someone that like me or someone else that has an amazing track record who can get you what you want for some money, then you don't have to do it yourself. That's great, especially because by having a publicist, and this is, you know, God bless a lot of of my colleagues and friends, because a lot of them, in fact, one one who was um, passing by, I guess, uh, while we were having lunch at, at, out in Orlando, who I just love, I think she's amazing. She speaks very much against having a publicist. I think most people these days are speaking against that and saying, you can do your PR yourself. Well, you can, but you also have to realize that by hiring somebody who is an expert in something that you are not an expert in, you should be getting expert level knowledge and experience. And um, yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who don't give, who call themselves experts that aren't. So you have to vet. Um, So if you have the money, that's the number one thing I would say is go talk to some folks and already before you talk to them, figure out what's it worth to you. What do you want to accomplish and what is the value of that for your business and what is your budget for that? And go into conversations as a serious um, buyer rather than going, oh, I wonder what it would cost if I did this and I have no idea what I'm going to spend and blah, blah, blah. If you don't have a budget or if you have a budget to have an assistant, for example, I would never recommend turning over any of this process to an assistant or a VA until you have dialed in your process successfully yourself. There's a lot of people billing themselves as like booking agents and things like that who actually don't have a track record or they are going to get you on shows that just started. Well, you get what you pay for. So if you (laughs) want to do your own strategy, first of all, Figure out who your, you got to know who your buyers are. And then what are they listening to? This is super easy. If you have an actual business, if you have actual clients and customers, if you have a real following of people who are giving you money to get your expertise, ask them, send out a quick email, 
and say, hey, I am looking at uh, my book launch that's coming up in a few months. P.S. Please do it a few months in advance. Don't just last minute go, oh, my book's coming out next week. I guess I should be on podcasts. <laughs> a lot of reasons about that, that I'm not going to waste the little bit of time we have left talking about. Just don't do it. Um, so you want to have at least three months leeway, ideally more if you can. So figure out, you know, who is it that you're selling to? What are they already listening to? Where are they already, what articles are they already reading? Like what blogs and magazines, things like that. Find out from them. And then um, you can also ask them too, like, hey, of the of the media that you read, where do you think would be a great place for me to write a column? You know, or for me, what's the, what do you think um, is a podcast that the host and I will have a great conversation, stuff like that. Yeah. That's number one. Start there. And then if you need more places, uh, and then here's the thing too, when you start there and you build an authentic real relationship and you give value first, it's very easy to ask then say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. Do you know anyone else you think would um, be a great a great show for me to guest on. Do you mind making an introduction? It's so natural, organic, and easy, but we're in this space of me, 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 and now, 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 now. And um, whenever you're in that push mode, you're going to be challenged. So just take a breath and think about the human beings that you want to connect with and tr and and connect with them how you would connect with a human being you wanted to have a relationship with. It all goes back to connections and relationships. So it's funny how it all circles back there. Hey, wild listeners. Have you been wanting to start a podcast for yourself or your business, but didn't know where to start? Or do you have a podcast of your own, but you're struggling with the time commitment? I'd love to help. Shoot me an email at max at hippodirect.com with any podcasting questions you have. I'm also happy to jump on a 30-minute call where we can discuss your idea, planning, production, promotion, and other elements of the podcasting world. Let your podcast run wild. We're going to switch it up a little bit and talk about inspiration and creativity. So typically we start off specifically with creativity, but in your case, I want to bring up something that, as you mentioned, we had lunch in Orlando at Podcast Movement in. There's something you, that you mentioned during that lunch that you probably didn't think too much about before you said it, but it really stuck with me. It was that I don't think much about whatever I think. <laughs> I'm in my 40s. I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah. You, so you just turned 21, and yeah. so, but you said everything I do goes back to joy and focused on joy and things I enjoy. So that just really, really struck me. So I want to, I want to start there. Why did you become so focused on and joy and how, how did that whole thing start? Well, since I was born, I've always focused there. I, I mean, that's, isn't that what we all want to be happy? I, I just, I've lived through challenges as we all have. And the reason that they're challenges is because they don't make me feel good. I'm not happy. And so by recognizing that I want my life to be happy. I want my life to be joy-filled. And that that's it. Like that to me is success. To be able to be genuinely happy and feel good, that's all there is. And so when I did things like worked in the Correctional Institute and stuff like that, I had forgotten that that is the the North Star. I forgot that life could be good because I was surrounded for so long and indoctrinated into feeling bad. But it wasn't always like that in my life, you know? And as children, when we're born, that's what we strive for. Why do we temper tantrum? Why do babies cry? Aside from, you know, their needs aren't being met. So they're not happy, <laughs> right? And then I was I was in this breakfast place that I go to yesterday and I kept looking over and I, I kept trying to say, don't judge Nicole, just pay, don't pay attention. But I kept looking over and it broke my heart because I could tell that the little girl was screaming and tempering and temper tantruming and 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 beside herself. She was probably about three because 
her mother, all she did was sit on her cell phone watching things the whole time and telling her to be quiet. The kid just wanted her attention, her focus. And that was it. And so, and she couldn't get it. So she acts out. And isn't that what we all do, right? We get Mm -hmm. frustrated in traffic or something happens and we react because we forget that at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is love, is joy, is peace in our own lives. We can't control what happens outside of our lives, but we absolutely can control what happens inside. And it's a... It's a big task to take that on because it's a lot easier to let things be the way they are and just deal with the ups and downs. And like a lot of people say, like, oh, well, that, you know, life's hard. No, it's not. Life doesn't have to be hard. And here's another thing I believe. I believe that in taking this mindset, you know, may be a value, may not, but I believe that everything in life happens for us, not to us. And I have believed that for as long as I can remember. I remember that when I was married and my husband was overseas and I was pregnant and I had a miscarriage, I remember thinking, no matter how painful it was, you know what? And and no matter how much we wanted a child, everything always happens for me, not to me. And that gives me comfort. And sure enough, everything, everything in my life has all the the good, the bad, the whatever. Um, It's always directed me to the next thing. And it's always been, it's always taken me the next thing and the next thing. And life is exciting. And the proof and the way that I know that everything happens for me and not to me is that it does. I mean, everything has directed me to where I am today. And And I like where I am today. And so the more I focus on joy and being with people who make me happy and in environments that make me happy and doing things that make me happy, the happier I am. (laughs) We we, we all like happy, Nicole. (laughs) Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And, And I think when you said it, what struck me so much was yeah, it's kind of, you know, when you take a second to think about it, it's like, duh, it, you know, everybody wants happiness, everybody wants joy, wants love. But I think you've taken a really strategic ap- approach to it. I mean, the fact that even you've said it out loud and stated it explicitly, and you're cognizant of the fact that, you know, when you're deciding on next things to do, or, you know, but when you're decision making, things that bring you more joy rise to the top. And so I, I just think you've taken a brilliant approach to it. And a lot of people can learn from that. So, thank you. You're welcome. So, let's say if joy is that North Star, I think something that can be closely associated with it is creativity because creativity often it, it's such a positive thing. I mean, it has such an optimistic connotation, and you need to have joy in your life and you need to have a positive outlook in order to maximize your creativity. So, in terms of creativity, What's the biggest thing that you do to stay creative? <laughs> yeah, thank you for for that. I'm I'm going to answer in a weird way perhaps. Hey, I love the weird ways. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, creativity is paramount. However, I can't get creative if I feel trapped. I can't just be creative on a dime. Now, that's my perception. And so a lot of people think I'm very creative and I appreciate that. Um, and so I can, you know, I, I can be creative for others with in, in all kinds of situations, but for myself to really get into the creative flow and where just all the magic happens I need to feel good. I need to feel free. And so for me, freedom equals creativity. I feel like if I'm boxed in physically, emotionally, or what have you, time-wise, and I have a specific box that says, okay, you must be creative now, it's it doesn't happen and my best work doesn't doesn't occur so for me it's that freedom so i build a lot of that into my 
my days into my calendar where there are certain times that I will do certain things, certain times people can get on my calendar and certain times they just can't. And sometimes I'll just take a whole day off. You know, if I'm looking at my calendar and I'm like, I just don't feel very creative right now or I feel stagnant or I feel stuck and I don't have any appointments the next day or whatever, um, that day or the next day or whatever, I'll just I'll just block some time off of my calendar until I do because I can't just get into creative mode um, the moment I say, okay, this is when you will be creative, Nicole. <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> not, I wish it did. I mean, I'm sure it does for other people. For me, it doesn't. Just press the button. So, yeah. So I like to give myself that freedom, that space to be and do and experience whatever I want. Sometimes I feel like I, I, changing space is a big thing for me. Sometimes I feel like driving out to the vineyards and I just I find the the region and where all the wineries are here in, in the Niagara region to be so rejuvenating, just soul quenching. And <laughs> so I'll go out there sometimes and just be, or I'll go out there and, you know, go have some beautiful food at a, at a restaurant that the chef, you know, makes the food with love. Like, I know this is, sounds very airy fairy and woo woo, but that's, <laughs> that is just, that's how I live my life. It's, if I don't live my life and I'm in the rush state and I'm in the have to state, then all my creativity shuts down and I start making poor choices. But when I can do that and when I can just go down to the beach and be alone and there's nobody down there, gosh, that's so much, that's so peaceful. And at that point, that's when I get those inspirations and that creativity. So often you hear people that, that there's beauty and constraint and that, by giving yourself constraints, sometimes you get the most productive or creative output. But sometimes, as exactly exemplified by what you just said, sometimes it's the opposite. And the less constraints you put on yourself and your workflow, the better the ideas are and the, the more positive you are. So, so I can dig that. Let's get to a fan favorite segment here, recurring segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. So Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. This is where we talk about a recent campaign or, or brand that's doing something really cool that caught our attention. And there was something in the email marketing space that caught your attention. Do you want to shout that out, Nicole? Absolutely. So there's a company doing some really, really cool stuff that is not a big name. And, you know, they don't have all of the affiliate marketers and all of the ads and all of the recognition that other companies do have. And it's unfortunate people don't don't know about them. So I'm actually, they're going to be on my podcast very soon. And it's the company is called Sendlane. The, um, the founder that I'm interviewing is Jimmy Kim. And he was an affiliate marketer for a very long time. And uh, he basically built a solution to the problems he was having, which don't we all like that's how we do our businesses. That's how all things are created. <laughs> right. And it has grown over the years to being like just a freaking beast of analytics and and value. And like the core of their system is to make you money. So the segmentation, all the reporting, all the things that you don't actually need to ever learn about that, you know, people need to know about in order to make money, but things that you don't have to worry about are done by this system they've created called Sendlane. And the crazy thing is, is that it's really affordable for people to get started with, even if they don't have, if they don't have a big list, I think, and I'm not sure, but I think think the smallest plan is like $35 a month. And it gives you so much. So even if you're just getting started and you want to really monetize, um, it's really for the online uh, space. So if you have a brick and mortar, it's probably not the best fit. But if you're wanting to do funnels and you're wanting to um, do marketing, like uh, newsletters and email marketing automations, things like that. I definitely, definitely recommend checking it out. And they're amazing. And yeah, I just think that 
more people should know about them because it's like, why just get email if you could get like a whole marketing team essentially behind you for the same price? And, and it scales, right? So it's like, there's no limit to how big you can get. And that's their goal is to help you grow. And it's just, it's very cool. And um, I think they definitely deserve a shout out. Awesome. Well, now it's official. So I think it's, they obviously have a really, really powerful strategy that works for them and, and their clients and you obviously. And the, the thing that stuck out to me about what you said is that when it's all said and done, they care about making you money. And so, yes. you know, you can add any feature in the world. You can add all these, you know, bells and whistles, as the kids say, uh, <laughs> all these different aspects of, you know, this is the new hottest thing or nobody else can do this. But if you get sidetracked from making people money or helping people make money, then there's no point to it. So I think that's something that we can all get behind. And that's the core of what they do too. Like they really care and they don't outsource overseas. Their office is in, they have a huge office in San Diego. They have 24 seven human support. So it's like, it, it's so good. And they, you know, Jimmy says, you know, just, you can email him personally. Like you actually can contact their people. You're treated like a human being who doesn't <laughs> need to know everything. You don't need to understand all the, how to do all the technical stuff. That's what they do. They just, they help you do run your business. Yeah. It's not the worst thing in the world to talk to another human. huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we only got a little bit of time left here. We'd love to wrap up with some rapid fire Q and A. You ready for it? So nervous, but go for it. Oh, I, I am freaking out over here as well. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get wild. What is your biggest pet peeve? Oh my God, so many things. Like we've just talked about 10 of them, right? Um, customer <laughs> service. Agenda. What's your just 11th how, biggest pet peeve? How, how we treat others, like just how people treat others, customer service wise, relationship wise, just like don't be a douche. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that, that has the feel of a new tattoo, I think. <laughs> I know you're big into fitness. What would you say is your favorite single exercise? Oh my gosh. Um, so funny. Big into fitness. Um, yeah, you're a fitness I'm, guru now, right? Yeah. I'm so not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, I like keeping my body fit. I mean, I do a lot of push ups because sometimes I can't get to the gym. So, like, I'll do, I'll press against my countertop in the bathroom. I'll, do different, different, you know, just drop and push up or things like that. That's, that's the easy go-to anytime. Perfect. Yeah. You can do them anywhere as long as you can, you know, push, extend your arms. How about if you were on, this is a hypothetical one. Imagine you're on a flight going around the world. It's a 24 hour flight, but your movie screen is stuck on one movie you can only watch one movie over and over again that whole flight what movie would it be if you could cho choose that one movie i wish i could honestly max i don't watch any movies or tv you don't watch any mo okay so I that don't. would be a very long flight for you <laughs> no but you know what that for me that's freedom. Like for me to be on a really now, as long as the plane is comfortable and I don't have a kid screaming or kicking the back of my chair, I'm happy. I'll um, see what somebody I can like do. sitting on my chair, you know, but no, for me, like just being away from reality and like normal life and in a space that I have absolutely nothing to do is for me the best time where my creativity sparks and I can go deep. All right. Well, we'll see you on the next flight. <laughs> and, uh, last question. Weird talents. What would you say is a talent that you have that has no impact on your business, but it's just something you're really, really good at, like something minor that's kind of random? It's totally random. Um, and it sometimes does have an impact on my business, though, but it shouldn't. Ooh. Eh. I'm just kidding. Oh, really? <laughs> no, you could say it. <laughs> okay. I see gaps. So like not just just like gaps in um theory and stuff. I see when things are off center or if there's like not uh, if there's like two spaces in a line 
rather than one space, but everywhere. Like I see them, <laughs> if pictures are are just barely off, you know, if they're just like slanted a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's a, I guess, a talent, but it drives me nuts. Wow. Okay. Well, you, <laughs> you, you first said that. I thought you meant Gap, like the Gap, the clothing store. And I was like, okay, you know, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of them too. And I never thought of it as a talent, but no, that's pretty. It's crazy. Like, yeah, like my friends who, who are hanging things, they'll be like, what do you think? And I'm like, nope, got to go here, got to go. Like, we don't need a level. And then we get a level and it's like, yep, that's level. Or like, oh, nope, that's not quite centered here. Scoot over a little bit. Okay, that's centered. Yes. And then, of course, you know, you don't have the measuring thing then, which you should. But then you get a measuring tape later and you measure it and it's it's perfectly centered. It's just weird. Oh, okay. Well, you're the human level then. So I that's like so. you're, you're, <laughs> you're a superhero. All right. Well, I know we got to wrap up, Nicole. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been a blast and really, really appreciate you opening up about a ton of things and sharing your tips for getting on podcasts and much, much more and shout out the gap, you know, cause why not? So thanks for coming on. <laughs> thanks so much, Max. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, of course. And where's the best place for people to connect with you? Uh, for sure. So as mentioned, I've got the Nicole Holland show. Um, you can search for that on any, on iTunes or any podcast app. And my website is the Nicole Holland and um, Instagram, the Nicole Holland. And yeah, shoot me a message. Let me know if there was anything that you took away from this episode that was valuable to you. I love to hear from people. I love building relationships. So that's it. May have to leave you some feedback in an Apple podcast review as well. <laughs> <laughs> and last thing here, it could be anything you want. It could be more gap conversation if you want. Final thoughts, the stage is yours. It could be a quote, it could be a line. Send us off here. Mm, so I think that what I want to leave everybody with is that regardless of what marketing strategy or tactic we're using, we are human beings doing business with human beings. And I think um, in the age that we're in right now, we've gone so far away from that human connection and people are craving it. So with whatever you do, rush less, consider more, and just be good to people and be good to yourself. Well, all that sounds mighty good. Thank you, Nicole, for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. To make the most out of these interviews, take a minute to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also explore our strategic marketing stories and lessons at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your place for wild marketing ideas every single week. And of course, of course, come hang out with the most talented and fascinating hippo in all of the world and beyond and uh, into multiple dimensions on social media at the handles HippoDirect and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!